space, literally the final frontier, so full of promise and potential. What technologies must we develop? What philosophical questions must we ask? Those are but two challenges we must face and overcome to achieve interstellar travel, to explore the vastness of the last frontier, space. These challenges, whilst difficult and even daunting, are what humanity needs. They are what humanity thrives on. Fortunately, they are also well within our means to wrestle with, and in time, as always, this too we shall achieve interstellar travel. In reward for our gallant efforts, for our hard work, is an infinite universe, perhaps, or more likely, a multiverse, rich and full in complete diversity, ripe for exploration and adventure. Oh, how wondrous space really is. This is essentially what we could, with much elbow grace, build today. It's a relatively feasible starship. It makes use of nuclear engines, could be fusion, could be fission. Engines front and engines are rear means that it can stop by thrusting forward instead of flipping over which would expose it to deadly radiation. The tiny centrifuge at front provides the needed gravity for when not in suspended animation. Because space is extremely brutal, the starship must be constructed using super alloys. Special electron treatment of a special hole coating will prevent the majority of harmful radiation from entering the ship. And, no matter what they tell you, others in space, which we must assume exist until proven otherwise, as a pragmatic caution, are going to be both friendly and not so friendly, perhaps even hostile. So the ship will need to be fitted with defensive, not offensive, systems. Point defense systems will do nicely and are needed to protect the ship against space debris anyway. Conceptually, this starship design looks and sounds good. However, despite what anyone may tell you, such a spacecraft is not nor can it be a real starship. You may ask why. Instead, Let's talk about real starships so that you could begin to see what constitutes a real starship. Real starships can and will come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Ultimately, the shape of a starship is not too important. What lies within how it functions absolutely is important. Until we are sufficiently advanced, as a general rule, our starships will fall within a window of certain design criteria, certain limitations due to the fact that certain components will be relatively primitive, that is, compared to what will be possible in the future. Until such time as we have more experience and are therefore able to refine them, such as being able to design and build more compact and efficient components. As you are already aware of, aerospacecraft need to be aerodynamically shaped to reduce drag since they travel at high speeds through a relatively thick medium, air. There are enough air molecules to resist and even superheat the airframe as the craft moves through them. Discs, conventional airframes, triangles, spheres, boomerangs, etc. are all valid aerodynamic shapes, especially if they are magnetohydrodynamically assisted, such as the case with the IOX. Interestingly, starships will also need to be somewhat aerodynamically shaped for the same basic reasons. At the extreme speeds the starship must travel up to the speed of light, the interstellar medium, gas, dust, and other debris will functionally do the same as air does to an aerospace craft. 
the more aerodynamic a starship is, the more efficient it is at deflecting all that it needs to, including a multitude of pernicious energies. These are jump ships, which are starships capable of leaping several light years via extreme acceleration, because distances between destinations are too immense for any other kind of starship. So-called conventional, or what is considered to be feasible generation ships, at the speeds they might be able to travel up to 20% the speed of light tops, means these ships will be forced to travel for decades, even hundreds or thousands of years. This is impractical for many reasons, but can be boiled down to two primary issues. Firstly, traveling beyond our system at speeds slower than the speed of light requires an unjustifiable amount of time to reach any destination. Secondly, this type of spaceflight is very dangerous and calls into question the success of each and every flight. Real exploration ships will be enormous settlement ships. They will make use of suspended animation, stasis pods, because of capacity limitations. Some components, such as the quantum ramjet and the warp coils, must be located relatively far from the habitat and other components because they emit, spray out, different kinds of extreme deleterious energies. They are not only dangerous to all living things, but to other components as well. This, of course, makes for an overall larger, wider and or longer starship. Space is larger than a shoebox and yet smaller than a grain of sand. In other words, it's everywhere and every when all the time. Or to put it another way, space is so big that it's able to contain all the stars and then some you see in the night sky. Typically, what limits a spacecraft is mass, not size. In everyday experience here on Earth, greater size usually means greater mass. In space, we could build large, voluminous, but low-mass spherical starships, especially since spheres are able to contain more volume per square area than, say, a cube or a triangle. However, depending on the ship's function, this is not always the best idea. Combined with mass reduction technology, and because space is so big, there really is no reason why we shouldn't build larger starships especially since we're going to need the space, pun intended, which means we're also going to need to devise a new method for building very quickly because a three kilometer starship is really big, requiring one heck of a lot of material. Only when we are more advanced will we be able to build smaller, personal sized starships that will be capable of jumping between systems. For now, and even into the distant future and corresponding level of technological development, for now, we need to think big, really big. These are among some of the starships we have tentatively pulled off our drawing boards discoids, spheroidals, triangles, boomerangs, etc. And these, larger spacer starships which sport a new kind of drive unit, the quantum vacuum ramjet, whereby no other reaction engine is needed. Note, there is no such thing as a reactionless drive. All drives, engines, whether field drives or jets, function by means of some sort of reaction, whether they grab onto and move, the virtual particles, or expel hot gases. The starship that is most near-term is the larger spacer and, as you can see, is one of the largest of all the starships, measuring several kilometers in length or more if needed. 
For the Spacer Starship, starting at the rear is located a singularity converter which is needed to initialize and power the quantum vacuum ramjets until the Starship is up to speed. Be sure to see the video description below for links to papers about black hole energy. The quantum vacuum ramjets, which are located at the farthest ends of the radiator, are far enough away from the main body and habitat to protect all the sensitive stuff, humans, cargo, and other components, from being harmed. The quantum ramjets function by extracting energy from the quantum vacuum field. It's a field filling all of space, consisting of quantum at the lowest possible energy states. Each quantum is extremely small, as small as it can be. Therefore, even a small volume of seemingly empty space is chock full of tiny energy quanta, which all adds up. A quantum vacuum ramjet is a device that acts on these tiny quanta, corralling them to do useful work, most likely by creating electron-positron pairs as has already been done with the aid of thin foils. In this way, combined with the deflective quality of both the deflection array and the warp field, the starship is able to achieve the speed of light for the purpose of jumping. Once the speed of light is reached, the warp field is now able to, and does, grab onto the surrounding tachyons which impart a large negative speed and thus the starship is hurled well beyond the speed of light, which nullifies both space and time. It's precisely this process that allows the starship to leap across vast distances of space and time. The large radiators are necessary to radiate unthinkable amounts of heat generated by numerous components. The quantum vacuum ramjets, the singularity converters, conduits, other components, particularly after the starship has completed a jump, taking up to as much as 88 hours to cool or perhaps longer. Fortunately, our starship will be made from a new kind of matter, one that is capable of enduring extremely high speeds and high loads for extended periods of time, years on end without deterioration. Currently, there are no materials on Earth capable of sustaining such extremes. None. Located at the rear of the starship, as well as within the central portion of the quantum ramjets, are singularity converters. Not black holes in the truest sense, but are very similar. These singularity converters utilize the electromagnetic Penrose process to produce negative energies. These energies are used both to power the starship's electrical systems and most critically supply the needed kind of energy and amount of energy required for a warp field up to and beyond the speed of light. Within the central shaft is located suspended animation units, some of the life support systems, the cargo and hangar bays, docking ports, a medical lab, fabrication lab, propellant storage, fusion reactors, energy storage, and other systems. At front is the habitat where the control center, crew compartment, computer systems, additional life supports, a recreation center, additional airlocks, and so on are located. Ahead of the habitat is the deflection array, which, by the way, is one of the reasons for why the habitat is located where it is. Think about it. Where else could you put the habitat to be protected more? The deflection array consists of several extremely powerful electromagnetic and particle projection systems and highly charged electrodes. 
not shown, each serving together to deflect debris for a minimum amount of energy and with a minimum resistance. The electrodes in the bow of the starship will, owing to the starship's speed, produce a very powerful and high frequency magnetic field, which is more than enough to impart a charge on any debris in its path, gases, dust particles, and even micrometeoroids. Once the debris has been charged or even ionized, powerful magnetic fields will be able to slightly nudge, cause the debris to glide off to one side or the other, missing the starship entirely. For debris that's too large for deflection, mounted in the prow of the starship will be powerful lasers and particle beam cannons used to partly vaporize or even outright obliterate the debris and thereby protecting the starship in the event that it is unable to dodge it. Initially, it was thought that the warping of space-time around the warp bubble propelled the starship. However, Jose Natero showed that this idea is incorrect. The warping of space-time is actually a kind of space-time drag, and therefore unwanted, and therefore should be completely avoided. Ordinarily, a warp drive deflects all fields and gravitation without resistance, producing a bubble with perfectly calm, flat space inside. With very minimal changes to the input power and to different sections of the warp coils, future starships with considerable ease will be able to produce a warp bubble with specialized curved space which will effectively serve as artificial gravitation for the crew. There's a lot more that could be discussed. We could go into great detail. However, we're going to end the video at this point. In time, there will be more information discussed. So for now, we thank you for watching and keep wondering about space. Thank you.